in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox and his donkey from the manger and lead it to water it? And ought not this woman a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. And as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the people rejoiced in all the glorious things that were done by him. Father, we thank you for the word. We anticipate that you would not give us this word and help us to understand it without expecting that we would obey. And so open our hearts and minds to hear and to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated and uh, please turn to Luke 13 if you have not already. Some of you will remember that just prior to the text that I read this morning, Jesus had been talking about the importance of bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. Luke follows that with this dramatic illustration from another occasion, most likely, that shows the two responses, two possible responses to Jesus' message. One is a response that is fruitful. The other a response that is fruitless. One is a response that is of grace through faith. The other is a response of legalism. Luke wants us to choose grace. That's the obvious message here. Hopelessly deformed, this woman chose grace. She's without help, without hope, without possibility of healing. And yet she comes and Jesus heals her. He is illustrating here, physically, something that we can see that's visible, that's clear, the truth of what he can also do spiritually, and that's what he wants to do in our lives. Now, as we look at this contrast today, we're going to see that legalism is basically speaking in this context to those who are unbelievers and how it keeps them in the chains of unbelief. But it also applies to those of us who are believers, because it's easy as a believer to develop a legalistic lifestyle and a legalistic approach to life. And so I trust that the Lord will speak to us whatever our condition in life through this uh, illustration of what legalism is all about. See, the woman was not the only actor in this drama. There's also the ruler of the synagogue, right? And his response is very different. He weighs in after she has been healed and he is not happy. Now think of that. The incongruity of that should have been happy, wouldn't you think? He's the ruler of the synagogue, the place where people come to worship God, the place where people come for healing, the place where benefits should be given to people. And yet, this woman who has been healed from an 18-year affliction does not touch him. He's just mad because his view of the way the Sabbath ought to be treated has been violated. Now, the question we have to ask is, well, what would cause such an ir irrational response to such a wonderful outcome? And the answer in one word is legalism. This man is a legalist. And his reaction here is intended by Jesus and by Luke, who gives us this story in this context. It's intended to show the dramatic difference, contrast between grace and legalism. One is submission to Christ, and a great love for him as a result. The other is sitting in judgment of Christ and hates his call for repentance. Dramatic difference. The question for us is, which one are we? 
Are we the legalist or are we the grace-inspired person who can't get enough of our Lord Jesus Christ? Now, I mentioned last week that many people think law and grace are at odds with each other, that they are sort of competitors. People in the Old Testament were saved by keeping the law. People in the New Testament were saved by grace. This is, beloved, not true, was never true, never could possibly be true. Law and grace have always been intended to work hand in glove to bring us to salvation. You will never understand law and grace until you understand that they are part and parcel of the same message from Christ. Those who think that the law was given to save people have missed the point altogether. The law was given for a reason, two great reasons at least, it was given, first of all, to show us our need of salvation. It was given to essentially push us down and demonstrate to us you can never do this. So don't be surprised that you can't do this. Be grateful that there's a solution to this. The solution is not to try harder to keep the law. The solution is to open yourself to God and say, please have mercy on me. That's the first purpose of the law. The second purpose of the law is to show us how to live after we've come to faith in Christ. It's to show us where the boundaries are. It's to show us what the character of God looks like. So that when Jesus says you must be holy as he is holy, we know what that means. So the law has these two great purposes. Now in the end, the law will also condemn those who will not accept grace. It's true. But the law is so good, beloved, and it's two great purposes to show our need and to light our path. The problem is not the law. The problem is legalism. The problem is legalism which misuses the law. The problem is using the law to try to be saved. The, the problem is trying to apply the law in ways that it was never meant to be applied. Legalism is me trying to earn what I can only have as a gift from God. Legalism is me playing God and submitting instead of submitting to God. I'm tempted to ask this question, but I don't want you to raise your hands. Uh, any of you know what a wine brick is? Because if you do, you were probably drinking during, during Prohibition. And uh, I see that very few of you would have been around during Prohibition, let alone drinking, of course. So you would not know. But a wine brick, when wine was outlawed during those years was a method that some of the bootleggers came up to, get the, to, to move their product. They would take the grape ex extract from the grapes and they would form it into a brick, kind of this, this, uh, this, this brick, and then they would put this label on it that made it legal. The label read like this. It said, do not let this brick set in a gallon of water for 21 days it will ferment and become illegal wine. They were circumventing the law. So they had their method that they could move their product and still let people know how they should treat this and how to have the wine they wanted without being legally culpable, which is exactly what legalism does. See, no one can keep the law. Not you, not me, not the best person that you ever knew, not your mom, bless her heart, or your dad. Nobody can keep the law. So the legalist comes along and says, so what I'll do is I will circumvent the law. I will make up things. That's what the Pharisees did. They said, here's what it really means. Here's an interpretation that I can keep. So they would keep the law as they interpreted it, and then they would say, hey, I am clean. They would declare themselves righteous. They circumvented the law by their legalist tag-ons. They forgot that God looks on the heart. God was never fooled. God never can be fooled. He knows exactly who we are inside and out. All they did was tragically you know, you know, get themselves in, 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 entangled in this system of regulations that kept them from true repentance, which is the only way that we can come to God. And the result of legalism is so evident in this man, and that's why I want to take a few minutes today to look at what does legalism look like. And as we go through this, obviously the primary focus here is in a person who's never come to faith in Christ. is trying to get there by keeping the law. But beloved, 
we as Christians can become very legalistic in our lifestyle as well. And we will have the same characteristics that, that this man did, even potentially as a Christian. So what characterizes legalism? Number one, it is compassionless. Legalism is compassionless. Here's a woman who has been 18 years with this horrible condition, so bent over she can't even look up. Would have been extremely painful as well as inconvenient. She's marvelously healed and suddenly she's standing, something she hasn't done for 18 years, straight as an arrow, and yet this man is, is absolutely untouched by that. Because why? Because legalism is heartless. It cares nothing for people. It only cares about rules. It's rule-oriented. Legalism is cruel. It is critical. It is joyless. It is crushing. I think the best way we can discover whether it's part of our life is how much criticism comes out of our mouth. Criticism is a sign of legalism. Legalists gladly condemn anyone who does not keep the rules as they understand them. And so it was with this man. He would have willingly, listen, he would have willingly consigned this woman back to her former brokenness just for the sake of keeping the law of the Sabbath as he understood it. That's legalism. It says in verse 14, look, at, look how indignant he was. It says, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. If he could have, he'd have bent her over again and sent her out and said, we're closed for healing today. Come back tomorrow. That's what he would have done. Legalism has no heart. You know, it's, it's, it's exactly this kind of legalistic cruelty that led to the Reformation. Do you, know, do you realize that? Martin Luther was a legalist. Martin Luther believed that the only way, because that's, that's what he'd been taught all of his life, believed that the only way that you can get to heaven and be right with God is by keeping the law. The only difference between Martin Luther and most people is he took that very seriously. He saw the sin in his life, and he kept seeing the sin in his life. He kept going to confession and going to confession. He would go six hours a day to confession as a monk. He wore his confessors out. One of them told him, Martin, go out and commit murder or you know, steal something or have an affair, something to come back and confess. Because he got it, that he was filled with sin and he was right. He just saw it better than most of us take time to see it. But he still despaired of his salvation. Martin Luther hated God. He hated a God that would impose upon him this which he could not do. If you hate God, you might be a legalist. Until you understand grace, you may hate God because of the demands. But then Martin began, he had fortunately had one good mentor who said, Martin, go read the Bible. Read it in the original language. You've learned how to do that. Martin began to read the New Testament he came across, among others, the verse in Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. And it began to come home to him, and he found other passages in Galatians and Romans that spoke to the fact that you cannot be, be saved by keeping the law. The verse we read this morning in Titus, we are saved not by works of righteousness that we have done, but by, the mercy, by his mercy he has saved us. And Martin Luther began to grasp the fact, it's not what I can do, it's what Jesus has already done. That's what salvation is about. He came to faith in Christ. He began to understand that salvation was a gift to accept, not a position to earn but he was still living in a society, he was still surrounded by a church that was committed to legalism, right? In the Middle Ages, the church had replaced grace as the message of the church with the message of salvation by grace through faith plus works. We misunderstand and we mistake when we say that the Roman church doesn't believe in, in grace, it only believes in works. That's not true, but it believes in grace plus works. That's the problem. 
First comes baptism. You must be baptized or you cannot be saved. But as soon as you sin after you're baptized, guess what? Your salvation flies out the window. It's gone. So now what? Baptized again? No, you don't have to be baptized again. But now you've got to come and confess to the priest. You've got to get penance and do penance. And now based on the merit of the saints who they've been so good that they have an excess, you can now tap into that and you can become saved again. But the next time you sin, same problem all over again. Got to go to confession, got to have penance. Last rites are imposed on penalty of not just going to purgatory, but, but going to hell. If you don't get the last rites performed, purgatory hangs over everybody's head. It's a heartless religion because legalism is heartless. Legalism is compassionless. The last straw for Luther was when a guy named Friar Juan Tetzel rolled into town. Tetzel was selling indulgences. What's an indulgence? It was a get out of jail free card, get out of purgatory free by paying money. The release of that excess merit of the saints, you could buy it. And he had a catchy jingle. I don't know how it sounded in German, but here's how it comes across in English. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. That was what he was literally saying. Now listen, beloved, you go online today. And since the time of Pope Benedict XVI, you can find you can still buy indulgences. Thought we did away with that in the Reformation? Still going on. The church was fleecing people. Just like the Pharisees in the Old Testament took the Old Testament and made up their own interpretations and their own rules that they could follow so that they could impose them on everybody else, well, that only what they could follow, and that's the way they came to their, to their salvation. So the Roman church had so corrupted the gospel message by the Middle Ages that their heartless legalistic traditions had come to mean more than the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Tradition meant more than scripture. Ritual meant more than relationship. Luther saw through all of it. As he examined scripture, he found, that he found nothing there about grace plus works. He found Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are we saved through faith, not, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. No works. The works come after. He found in Scripture no excess merit on the part of saints. He found no penance, no last rites, no purgatory, no indulgence. He didn't find any of that in Scripture because it's not there. He said salvation is by grace, through fa grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone. And on penalty of death, he would not recant and the Reformation got underway, but that's legalism, beloved. Rules replace relationship, but you can never be sure what enough is. <laughs> All you can be sure is that what you get right today, you're going to mess up tomorrow. It's a power play. Legalism is a power play to allow some to look down on everyone else. And even as Christians, we do the same when we begin to pose, impose rules on other people that we keep that are not in the Bible, but because we keep them, we can look down on those who don't. Legalism is heartless. Number two, legalism is truthless. Legalism is truthless. Look at the synagogue ruler again, verse 14. He says, there are six days in which we're, and by the way, notice, it's, it's kind of interesting. Did you notice the synagogue ruler didn't address Jesus directly? I find that really interesting. I don't know exactly what to read into that, except I think he was scared of them. He turned and said to the people, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. I have a question for you. Do you think if that woman had come back the next day that she would have been healed by this man? I don't think so. She'd been 18 years a part of this parish in this condition with no healing. Listen, beloved, legalism promises what only God's power can deliver. 
Legalism promises what it cannot deliver. You must realize that. Legalism cannot deliver on what it promises. Legalism is powerless to heal and legalism is powerless to save. Legalism is powerless to get right with God. Legalism is powerless to be acceptable to God. But there's a whole world of people out there who believe that this is the way to go, that legalism's lie. They believe the lie that they can be good enough. They believe that it can save them. Just keep the rules, or at least keep them most of the time. We're all a little naughty now and then. What's the big deal? That's legalism's lie. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Legalism lies and says, you can be the way. There is no such thing as truth, and you can have life. But the only way to the Father is through your own effort. That's legalism's reinterpretation of John 14, 6. But it's a lie. It's all lies. Suppose an edict went out and the edict said everybody's going to go to jail unless you can buy your way out. And you just catch the end of that in your car on the way home and here's this radio announcement and all you know is it says, wow, I'm going to go to jail unless I can buy my way out. So you get home, what do you do? Start counting your money, right? And then you, but, but, but after you get a little ways along, you're thinking, well, wait, I don't know how much this is going to cost. I better flip on the TV and find out. And you flip on the TV and the first thing you hear is, you know, this breaking news just in. This morning they picked up the following guys who couldn't pay their way out. Donald Trump, Bill Gates, and Warren Buffett. Now what are you going to do? I'll tell you what you're not going to do. You're not going to keep counting. Not going to matter. If those guys couldn't pay their way out, what possible chance do you have? See, what legalism is telling you is you can buy your way out. And what Jesus is saying is the best person who ever lived couldn't buy their way out. That's the message of Luke 16, where we're going to get there in a few weeks. It talks about the rich man and Lazarus, the poor man. The rich man had every benefit in this life. He had all the money that he could want. He had all the morality that he could want. But the Bible says that when, and Lazarus had nothing. But when they died... Lazarus was in the bosom of Abraham in heaven and the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, the Bible says. He could not buy his way out. He could not moralize his way out. He could not earn his way out. This is the truth of Scripture. Hell will not be populated, beloved, mainly by extremely evil people. They'll be there. But it will be populated mostly by really nice people who thought they were good enough but weren't because nobody is. But that's the lie of legalism. The rich young ruler who thought he'd kept the whole law wasn't good enough. As Jesus pointed out with one simple demand to him, legalism lies through its teeth. It says you can earn your way to God or you can buy your way to God or you can moralize your way to God. It's not true. It's truthless. It's powerless. Thirdly, legalism is characterless. It's without character. This is Jesus' point beginning in verse 15. It says, the Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? You hypocrites. Jesus is saying, basically, let's take off the masks, guys. Let's take off the masks. You care more about your livestock than you do about this poor woman, and yet that's your life's work, to care about people. There's two, kind of two plays on words here that help our understanding of this passage. If you look at verse 12, you'll see that Jesus says, woman, you are freed from your disability. The word freed is literally the word loosed. Loosed. It's the Greek word luo. It's the first word we learned in Greek class because it's, a, it's an extremely 
um, what's the word? It's, 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 it's an extremely regular verb. You can do anything with it, and it turns out to be right. Luo, to be loosed. You are loosed. And now look at verse 16. And not, not this woman, this daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound for 18 years, be loosed. Same word. From this bond on the Sabbath day. So she is being loosed by Jesus. But now look at verse 15, where Jesus notes concerning these rulers in the synagogue, the ruler and his crowd. Jesus notes each of you on the Sabbath. Untie. It's the same word. Loose. You loose. Don't you untie your ox to give it water? What Jesus is saying is this. He's saying, you guys, give yourself a waiver to loose your ox or your donkey or whatever so you can give it water. And yet when, this, when I loose this woman from her 18-year affliction, you want nothing to do with it. You're hypocrites. You're more willing to see your animals taken care of than you are this poor woman. He goes further. In verse 14, there are six days in which work ought, in which work literally it is necessary to be done. It's the little, little Greek word D-E-A. It's a very important word in the New Testament. It is necessary. It means something that is absolutely necessary, something that is uh, imperative. There are six days in which work ought to be done. That's what the, that's what the ruler of the synagogue says. It's, it, it's, it's the six days. That's when work is necessary for work to be done. Jesus responds in verse 16 and he says, ought not, is it not necessary? Same word, day. Is it not necessary for this woman to be loose? What he's saying here is this. He's saying you've got your necessities all messed up. You think what's necessary is to work on the six days and not on the Sabbath. Fine, that's what you say by your definition of work. I'm telling you, it's necessary that this woman be loosed on the Sabbath. And what did he mean by that? What was the meaning behind the meaning? Well, what does the word Sabbath mean? It means rest, right? The word Sabbath means rest. And he's saying, you don't even understand the spirit of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is for rest. This woman has been 18 years in this condition. I'm giving her rest by loosing her from this condition today. That's what the Sabbath is about. You think it's just about your work rules. Let me tell you what's necessary. What's necessary is for the work of the Sabbath to be done on the Sabbath. You don't understand the law and you don't understand the spirit behind the law. You don't understand God and you don't understand the God who gave the law. You don't understand God's heart. You just understand ritual. That's all you know is rules. You don't understand relationship. Legalism is always hypocritical. It's always looking for a way to look down others. It's always looking for a way to push others down so that I can look better. That's the way legalism works. It's totally hypocritical. It's like the guy that's, you know, this cartoon shows a guy standing at this counter with a big sign over it. it says Marriage License Bureau. And there's a clerk behind it. The guy's looking very forlorn, you know, and he's holding this piece of paper and she's looking at it. And the clerk says to him, says, Sir, will you please stop coming here every day? Your license has not expired. It will never expire. It's a marriage license, folks. <laughs> come, come with me <laughs> on this journey. Your marriage license will not expire. Here's a man looking for a loophole. He's not looking for a relationship. That's what legalism does. It's looking for a loophole. It's not looking for a relationship. It's looking for how little can I do and still get in. How can I live the life that I want to live and still somehow sort of think I'm good enough? Legalism is hypocritical. Fourthly, legalism is Christless. Legalism is Christless. It doesn't care about a relationship with Christ. It only cares about the rules. It wants to know the minimum requirement. It's not interested in maintaining a relationship with God. It just wants to know, how can I, you know, kind of get to heaven later? How can I have my fun now? 
and still have heaven later. The woman walked away knowing Christ. The man walked away judging Christ, and he was therefore Christless. Listen, you cannot be sitting in judgment of Christ and have Christ. This doesn't mean that the man didn't know about Jesus. He did. He was seeing him face to face, right? He was seeing him in a way you and I don't see him today. He knew about Jesus. It doesn't even mean that he didn't think that maybe he was a little bit of a good man. He might have. I don't know. He'd seen him heal somebody, have compassion. But he believed in himself more than he believed in Jesus. He believed that he was a better interpreter of rules and of life than Jesus was. He believed in what he wanted to believe rather than in what Jesus said he needed to believe. So therefore, he was judging Jesus to be wrong. He was judging what Jesus claimed to be wrong. He believed himself rather than Jesus. It's a disease that's epidemic in our own world. People are happy to acknowledge that Jesus was a pretty good guy, that he was a great prophet, that he was a mighty man of valor in some sense, someone to be admired, but God in the flesh, no way. That can't happen. Come on, give me a break. How do you come to that conclusion? Not by the teaching of the New Testament where we learn about Jesus in the first place, right? The only way you can come to that conclusion is by judging Jesus yourself. It's by saying, I don't believe what the Bible says about him at this point. I believe what I think must be right. We're judging Jesus. And I have to tell you, beloved, if that's you this morning, you're Christless. You can't just believe Jesus is kind of a good example and kind of a nice guy to lead you along and, and show you how life is and still be someone who has Christ. In refusing to acknowledge who he really is, you have lost him. Colossians 1 19, what did Paul say? It says, for in him, Christ, dwells all the fullness of God. Not part of it, not half of it, not one-third of it, all of it. Jesus is as much God as you can possibly get. To deny that is to deny him this was no ordinary but great man. He's not a fine prophet or a guru, a religious guru of some kind that he's been made out to be. And to accept him as anything less than that is to be Christless. Listen, one of the, you know what, one of the great proofs, we talk about a lot of things here, but one of the great proofs of the deity of Christ, you know what it is? It's the fact that literally thousands of Jewish people from the first century eventually believed in Jesus. You say, how is that any proof of his deity? Well, think about it for a second. What was at the heart? Now listen, Jesus could have been exposed to Eastern religion or somebody else where they say God is everything, everything is God, there's no transcendent God, there's just God in nature and everybody could be God. And if, yeah, okay, if you say Jesus is God, fine, we'll put one more little idol up on the shelf. But not the Jews. The Jews didn't even begin to think that way. Their concept of God was that he is transcendent, that he's the creator, that he's outside of anything that we know. He made us. The Jews believed that Jesus, uh, that, that God was one and only one, that there wasn't any other God. The belief, what, what was the, 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 the core of their belief was the Shema, what, we've rec what we have memorized in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That was the core belief of the Jewish people. And here comes this average, normal-looking guy. In fact, maybe not even that much because Isaiah 53, 2 describes him this way, that he had no form or majesty that, I, that we should look on him. Jesus didn't look like God. But he comes along saying, oh, by the way, I'm God. The Jewish people would not have known what to do with that. That was one of the problems. They struggled and struggled and struggled with that. And in Jesus' lifetime, there weren't very many who came to faith in him, right? But within a few weeks after, there were thousands of people in Jerusalem, thousands of Jewish people who were, who were dyed in the wool monotheists because that's what they'd been taught all their life. 
who suddenly had to acknowledge that, yes, Jesus is God. How could they, why, why would they do that? Because they had seen him, the perfection of his life, of his being, of his person, because they had seen the extraordinary, compassionate person that he was, because they had seen grace and truth, as John says in John 1.14, they'd seen all that magnified, because, because he was tenderness and love and power all rolled into one. And as, as his fame began to go abroad, they knew this. All of that played into it. But here's the reason primarily, because Jesus died and rose again. It all hinges on the resurrection. When somebody does that, you can't just kind of throw him aside and say, I, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. So how did that happen? So you have thousands, literally thousands of people in Jerusalem in the first century church who not only suddenly believed in Jesus and believed that he was God, but that who also gave up the rules that they had been living all their life about the Sabbath and began to worship on the first day of the week. Think about the implications of that. How could that happen? They gave up the sacrificial system that they had been taught all their life was the key to everything. Why? Because they saw Jesus now as for who he is and for what he is, as the fulfillment of all of this, as the Son of God incarnate, as God in the flesh. And by this time, incipiently, it had been to develop the, the concept of the Trinity. They probably didn't know the fullness of it like we do today, but as they began to study the Scriptures, they said, oh yeah, there's a sign of the Trinity in the Old Testament. Oh yeah, the name God, Elohim, is plural in the Old Testament. Never really picked up on that before. Oh yeah, God said in Genesis 1, let us make man in our image. Who in the world was he talking to? To the second and third persons of the Trinity. And so they begin to understand what the Bible teaches about who Jesus really is. Do you know that Jesus? Because if you don't, you're Christless. And that Jesus, who is God in the flesh, says you can't come to the Father, but by me, the whole world believes in God. So are they saved? No. Not unless they've come through the Son who reveals him. Legalism is Christless, does not believe in God, that Jesus is God. Which means, the fifth one is a natural follow-on, legalism is salvationless. Legalism is salvationless. Jesus makes this point in a dramatic way in this passage. Look at verse 16. He says, Jesus says, ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, stop there. Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham. What's Jesus doing? What's the, what, what does it matter that she's a daughter of Abraham? They would have assumed everybody in the synagogue is the son or daughter of Abraham, so what's the point? Why would you call this woman a daughter of Abraham? Why? Why did Jesus say that? Because he's drawing, beloved, an intentional contrast between who they were and who she was. They thought that they were sons and daughters of Abraham. Well, physically, they were. But they weren't the sons and daughters of Abraham in the sense that this woman was now the daughter of Abraham because she is the daughter of Abraham not just physically, but spiritually. She is the daughter of Abraham not because she was just born a Jewess, but because she has now accepted accepted the truth of God expressed in Jesus Christ in a way that they were not willing to do. She is a daughter of Abraham because she has followed Abraham in his faith. When God said Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, she's now in that camp and they're not. She's saved and they're not. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's drawing the contrast. It's not enough to be a child of Abraham by birth. One must be a child of Abraham by rebirth. This should not have been new to them. God had made the point all the way through the Old Testament. Passages like Deuteronomy 10, 16, and I could multiply these, but let me just give you this one. Deuteronomy 10, 16, God challenges the people. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart. How are you going to do that? Physically somehow cut into your heart, 
perform a circumcision operation. Can't do that. What's, he, what's his point? It's not enough to be included in the covenant by virtue of your outward sign of circumcision. You must have a heart that's turned toward God. That's his point. You don't get rid of sin by being a daughter or a son of Abraham by birth and being disobedient the rest of the time. You become a son or daughter of Abraham in the fullest sense by a heart that has turned toward God. You get rid of sin by turning from sin in your heart. It's repentance. It's the same thing we find in the New Testament over and over. Paul absolutely nails it. Turn to Romans 2. If you think I'm just kind of pulling this out of a hat. Romans 2. Look at this. In Romans 2, beginning in verse 28. Paul is, uh, Paul is here taking the Jews to, he's taking the Jews to task. First chapter of Romans, he's, he's basically demonstrated that the pagan world, sure enough, they are you know, outside of God. But now in chapter two, he's showing the Jews, but guess what, so are you guys. <laughs> they, they couldn't believe that. They had the sons and daughters of, of, of Abraham, that's all it took. Abraham, after all, they'd been taught from the time they were kids, Abraham sits at the gates of hell and will, will not let a Jewish person enter. That's what they'd been taught. And Paul is saying, no, 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 you're, you're sinners right along the rest. You need salvation just like the rest. You must come just like the rest. And so he says in Romans 2.28, he says, for, there, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. It's not enough. Nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart, just like the Old Testament had always said. Circumcision is a matter of heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. The Pharisee and the rulers of the synagogue, what were they interested in? The praise of man. They were following the rules. They cared not for God. And they'd forgotten that David had said in the Old Testament in Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are bulls and rams and goats and lambs? Is that what they are? No. David said the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. That that's what this woman had that the ruler of the synagogue did not, and so he, she had salvation, he did not. Legalism is always salvationless. flight attendant came over the intercom said ladies and gentlemen I'd like to welcome you to Honolulu a couple minutes later the plane pulled up to the gate and she came on again said as I said before I'd like to welcome you to Honolulu unfortunately we're in Fresno we're in Fresno it's kind of funny, right? But it won't be funny the day that legalism makes the announcement over the intercom. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to heaven. Unfortunately, we didn't make it. We didn't make it. Legalism can't take you where you want to go. So what can? Grace, the grace of God, expressed in the person of Jesus Christ, throwing yourself in the mercy of God, for by grace are we saved through faith. And even that's not of ourselves. That's a gift of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for grace. We acknowledge that we are prone to want to save ourselves. I think if we just had this thing or that thing or could do this thing or that thing, that that would make life worthwhile. And that's what we look to to save us. And legalism says, yeah, and you can, you know what? You want to take care of the afterlife? Just be, just be good. Be better than the next guy. And it's all a lie. Because it's only by grace through faith that we can become right with God. Nothing that we do, everything that he does. What a privilege. Lord, that should turn our hearts inside out in thanksgiving and gratitude and 
cause us to live totally differently because we are saved by grace. It may be true. I pray that there's no one here this morning that hasn't experienced that. And Lord, as we take a few moments just to contemplate what you have said to us today, I pray that you will open hearts to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.